Today we're checking out this pretty mental but pretty unique motherboard from ASUS. Generally, their Impact Series motherboards represent balls to the wall power in the ITX form factor, and that's something that I can definitely get behind. The Maximus 8 Impact for the Z170 series, for example, saw a completely separate PCB for the powerful VRM, simply because there wasn't enough space for it otherwise. Three years later, the Impact Series is back, and this time supporting the new high core count Ryzen CPU, but there's a twist. This isn't actually mini ITX, it's mini DTX, but I personally don't think that's an issue. So meet the X570 Crosshair 8 Impact, definitely one of the top enthusiast boards for the AM4 platform, and definitely the top board when it comes to compact Ryzen systems. So what the heck is Mini DTX? Well, it's basically the same form factor as a Mini ITX in terms of the horizontal width of the PCB, but it is stretched vertically to meet the length of the first two PCI expansion slots in your case. So if you were using a two slot graphics card plugged directly into the PCIe slot on your ITX motherboard, there would otherwise be unoccupied space behind the graphics card. For the Impact series though, unoccupied space is not really a thing, so they decided to make use of it. Now there has been a ton of criticism for this board for not being a true Impact board because it's not actually mini ITX like the rest of the Impact boards have been. So it's not going to fit in premium small form factor options like the Dan A4 SFX or the Go to S1, but I don't think that actually matters. The fact of the matter is, if you're spending this much money on a motherboard, you're likely pairing it with the 12 core 3900X or the upcoming 16 core 3950X and calling either of those processors in a slim case like a Dan A4 SFX is going to be pretty much impossible. Adequately cooling the 3900X for example will require at least 110 mils of CPU cooler height or something like a 240 mil AIO. At that point, you're looking at something like the NZXT H210, the NK M1, or something that can support large tower coolers like the Silverstone LD03, or something similar like that. So the Crosshair 8 Impact does fit in all of those cases, basically any case that has enough radiator space or cooler height for you know, calling the 3950X, for example, you will be able to fit this board in there. So this design decision does make sense. All right, now let's take a look at the board. And at first glance, this thing is really dense. The board is a very dark color scheme and will look solid in pretty much any build. And in true ROG nature, we do have RGB illumination on the right underside of the board. On the rear of the board, we do get a really nice looking backplate that will protect the PCB. But what's interesting here is that there's actually a substantial heat pipe underneath. So this makes contact via thermal pads to the backside of the vCore VRM, one of the hottest areas on any motherboard, and the heat pipe also swoops around to the back of the PCIe 4.0 x16 slot. So this is something that you don't see on many motherboards today, but it does definitely help and it is appreciated. The rear IO is well equipped, you'll find Wi-Fi 6, a clear CMOS button if your overclock does not go to plan, BIOS flashback to easily update your BIOS without a CPU, USB Gen 2 Type-C and 7 Type-A ports. They've also put the postcode display back here, which I think is a good idea. This would most likely be otherwise pretty hard to read being buried in an ITX case. Conveniently, we do get an integrated IO shield here too, which is nice, and some exhaust ventilation cutouts for something directly behind it. We'll take a look at that in just a minute. Towards the bottom of the board, we see the audio circuit. As always, if you're an audio enthusiast, you'll want to use something external. The one here uses the Realtek AI. ALC1220 codec, which is going to be absolutely sufficient for most users, but just don't expect anything mind blowing. To the right of the board, you'll also find a convenient little onboard start button. Very handy if you plan on using this on an open test bench. All right, now to the fun stuff, starting with this SODIMM module here. This is a pretty common trick that ASUS are doing lately with their enthusiast boards. And in this case, we gain two pretty vital M.2 PCIe 4.0 slots, two four pin fan headers, and a three pin RGB header. The M.2 two drives get some direct cooling here too, and paired with the better overall position for them, you're not going to have an issue with thermals for the M.2 drives at all. In fact, tested inside the NCASE M1, the Gen 4 NVMe drive hit a peak temperature of just 50 degrees C, so performance here is going to be much better compared to burying the M.2 drive behind a graphics card or on the back side of the board. Do note that this SODIMM board will get in the way of large tower air coolers, but it will be fine for AIOs. 
The most interesting part of the Crosshair 8 Impact though is underneath this I.O. shroud. Underneath there we see two 40mm fans providing active cooling for the V-Core VRM and also the chipset. You can't control the fan speed of the chipset fan that spins at 3500rpm pretty consistently but the VRM fan can be controlled and there you have a range from around 1500rpm all the way up to about 10,000rpm to play with. At 1500rpm it is pretty much silent, in fact I never found it to get to an audible level under load, especially under the radiator fans. So if you are concerned about the noise of these small fans, you can just disconnect them if you really want, but the noise contributed by them in an entire system is pretty negligible. Now let's take a look at that VRM, and here's where things get pretty interesting. We can count 10 power stages in total here, two are on the backside for the SOC, leading many to believe that this is an 8 plus 2 phase VRM, meaning that the CPU core current would be split into 8 discrete channels, but that's not the case. Instead, this is just a 4 plus 2 phase VRM because the PWM controller here being used is a rebranded IR35201 and that is not capable of outputting 8 plus 2 phases. So 4 phases might disappoint some here, it certainly caused an outrage on previous ROG boards, but the thing is ASUS are using insanely premium and efficient power stages here and they're rated for up to 70 amps each. The main downside of the lower phase count is going to be a less stable and larger amplitude voltage ripple heading to the CPU, whereas this could be tightened up with a higher phase count. A four phase VRM independently does not mean that your VRM is going to overheat or that the VRM design is poor, just that you might need a few extra millivolts on the CPU V core for stabilizing an overclock. Also keep in mind that the benefit of a higher VRM phase count shrinks the more phases that you add. For example, going from two phases to four phases, we'll see a significant reduction in voltage ripple amplitude, but going from four phases to six phases is not going to give you the same improvement. Now would be a good time to take a look at the VRM thermals and overclocking. And I'll just say that these are some of the best VRM thermals that I've seen on any X570 board. We're also testing this inside a small form factor case, granted with pretty good airflow, but it's a no brainer looking at these numbers that the Crosshair 8 Impact will handle even an overclocked 16 core 3950X when that's finally released. Overclocks were right in line with what I was able to achieve on the X570 Aorus Extreme 2, so stabilizing an overclock here is not going to be a problem. I will also mention that one of my biggest concerns for X570 since launch, the absurdly high idle voltages and thermals, seem to be mostly fixed with the latest chipset driver. For the most part, the 3900X sat around one volt flat when sitting on the desktop, but we do still see the occasional spikes up to 1.5 volts, where we do also to see the CPU temperature spike up to around 70 degrees C. So a big thumbs up to AMD for the improvements here, but there still is a bit of work that needs to be done. So the Crosshair 8 Impact is an awesome board, but of course the problem is going to be the price. It's going to be hard to recommend unless you're going with the 16 core 3950X or going with the 12 core 3900X and still heavily overclocking that. Uh, it's not that it's a ripoff that it's hard to recommend. It's certainly not a ripoff. These Impact boards cost ASUS a lot of money in R&D and a lot of time to make. And and still, it is priced well below something like the X570 Aorus Extreme or the X570 Godlike. Just because you're getting a smaller board overall does not mean you're getting less features. I mean, of course, you have less slots and less components overall, but VRM thermals here are superb. We've got 70 amp power stages, active cooling, uh, features for LN2 overclocking. I mean, the list goes on. We even have a heat pipe running around the back of the motherboard. So just because it's a smaller board does not inherently mean that it's you know, getting less value. I can guarantee you that people will be buying this board for the 3950X, throwing that in the NKS M1 and doing a custom loop. However, if you do want something cheaper, ASUS's own X570i Strix comes in at $170 cheaper than the Impact and also has an actively cooled VRM. However, that board I have yet to test. Otherwise, the ROG X570 Crosshair 8 Impact is an insanely cool board and one that will run insanely cool too, even in a small form factor case with overclocking. If you guys would like to see me do a proper water-cooled build with this motherboard in the NKS M1 V6, let me know down below. Maybe when the 3950X finally launches, that will be something to consider. As always, guys, a huge thanks for watching. Consider subscribing down below if you haven't already, and I'll see you all in the next one.